At Lakewood's Drive this year, we are going all the way through the book of John on Sunday mornings in the lessons that I'm preaching. I plan to do three per month. That's a total of 36. Uh, Clearly, you're not going to be able to cover the entire book of John in uh, 36 lessons. So the idea was for me to use these afternoon sermons uh, on YouTube to help plug some of the gaps. Well, we skipped chapter 5 entirely uh, at, uh, at Lakewood's Drive, which is... Unfortunate, obviously, but you got to make some tough calls. I thought we'd spend a little bit of time, at least, talking about this this fascinating story that's found in John chapter five, where Jesus heals this lame man at the pool. I'd like to begin by reading through uh, chapter five, uh, first few verses at least, and then we'll come back and make some uh, some applications with regard to the healing that Jesus provides for us, a uh, spiritual healing particularly, although physical is part of it as well. Starting in verse one, I'm reading from the Christian Standard Bible. After this, a Jewish festival took place, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. By the Sheep Gate in Jerusalem, there is a pool called Bethesda in Aramaic, which has five colonnades. Within these lay a large number of the disabled, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One was there who had been disabled for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and realized he had already been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to get well? Sir, the disabled man answered, I have no one to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I'm coming, someone goes down ahead of me. Get up, Jesus told him, pick up your mat and walk. Instantly, the man got well, picked up his mat, and started to walk. Now that day was the Sabbath. That goes through verse number uh, nine, and we'll stop there. And before we get into this, let's have a word or two about the verses that I did not read. Uh, Depending on what version you may be reading out of, you likely are kind of scratching your head because part of verse, I think it's verse 3 and then all of verse 4 are omitted from the text in the CSB, as they are in several other versions. Other versions may also include uh, this text but have brackets around them with a side note, etc. I don't want to get too sidetracked with regard to this, but a brief word since we read the text there is some textual discrepancy with regard to whether these verses did or did not uh, belong in the original uh, the original text. The conventional wisdom seems to be with modern scholarship that a later editor, a later copyist, had inserted what they call a gloss, which you might call a commentary, a side note, trying to explain a Jewish tradition, a Jewish, you might call superstition, but uh, tradition anyway why people were gathered at the pool, why this man was gathered at the pool. And eventually over the centuries after copies of copies of copies were made, somehow this gloss got incorporated into the general text. And these uh, are the, this is the version that the King James and New King James were working off of. That's one theory, at least. I tend to support that theory. Uh, Whether you do or do not makes no difference to me, especially. I will point this out though. And this is pretty much the... Well, it is the rule. It's pretty much a universal truth with regard to these so-called discrepancies in the text. There is no question from either reading what's going on in this story. The narrative is not altered, and certainly the gospel of Jesus Christ is not altered. There's never any real question about what is being taught, what is being expected of you and me. These uh, so-called contradictions are not contradictions at all. There, there is discrepancy. Any work of human beings, including our copies of the Bible, are going to have flaws, and we need to work through that. And this is one of the reasons why it's a good idea for you to read multiple translations of the Bible, because different people have different ideas. But in any case, whether you truly, and by the way, in case you don't know what I'm talking about, there's the gloss here, the, the uh, redacted terms, words, are basically saying that an angel would go down to the the pool and trouble the waters. And that's where this miraculous activity, this alleged miraculous activity, actually took place. And there's a lot of debate about whether this is just a superstition among the Jews, whether there actually was an angel, why it would be that a miracle would occur on a semi-regular basis with no prophet involved, no message from God involved. This would be, as far as I can tell, completely unprecedented in uh, in Bible history. That doesn't mean it didn't happen. It's just a a comment, one of the reasons why I think the text probably is added on later. But uh, either way, I I would say this, if you have an issue with people, quote unquote, taking verses out of the Bible, 
I would urge you to have the same kind of moral indignation about people putting verses into the Bible that don't belong. It seems like one is just as bad as the other. At any rate, uh, debate that uh, on your own time, as it were. Well, we're here to talk about the actual story here and the idea of Jesus coming to heal this man and this question, do you want to get well, which seems on the surface to be just kind of silly. In fact, the, the lame man doesn't really respond to the question directly. The assumption is, why would I be here if I didn't want to get well? And it really kind of connotes a, a certain weird mix of faith and despair in the thoughts of this man. After all, he is at the pool, and he wouldn't be at the pool if he didn't have some confidence that salvation could be found there. At the same time, he really doesn't seem to have any kind of real expectation that it's ever going to come to his doorstep, as it were. And I don't doubt that there are people, maybe you're one of them as you're listening to this, who have the same kind of attitude towards spiritual healing. Uh, You're aware that your status before God is not right. You're aware that that you're in sin. You're aware that that you are not uh, right before God. And you're aware, at least in some vague sense, that salvation is available. But actually attaining it, actually coming in contact with it, seems too remote, too impossible, too unlikely, as it were. And maybe there's some kind of excuse that's made here. Uh, There's no way God could save a sinner like me. Uh, Surely I'm beyond redemption. I've sinned too long, too hard, too joyfully, etc. And uh, I think a lot of that is is self-deception, deliberate self-deception that's designed to allow somebody to stay in a sinful state. I hope that that's not where you are. I hope that if you genuinely want salvation, you have confidence that salvation is available to you. And the question goes out to you, do you want to get well? Jesus asks asks the question because there's a real answer. If you want to get well, you can and you will get well. Not because You cross T's or dotted I's necessarily because Jesus has inserted himself into your life. And because he has, you have the opportunity to avail yourself of the salvation that is found in his blood through his grace. And we'll probably talk a a little bit about about grace and works and the balance that's struck uh, between the two here. I think this passage does a really good job of indicating where salvation comes from and the only place it can come from, in fact but also touching on your personal responsibility. And let's not dodge that. Let's not try to avoid personal accountability with regard to this kind of thing. If you want to be saved, if you want to be well, you can be healed. That's the message of this story. You just have to put your your faith in the right place, Uh, not in a pool, but in Jesus. And and we'll, we'll probably come back to the idea of, of obedience and maybe baptism particularly later on. But just in case, there actually is this person out there. I've never met him. I've heard about him my entire life. I've never met him. If there is actually a person out there who thinks that salvation can be found in a tank of water, whether it's at the church building, at the, at the beach, whether it's you know your personal bathtub or swimming pool, whatever it happens to be, if you think that somehow salvation is found in a certain amount of water, that's ridiculous. That's not where salvation is. And this story, that's not the point of the story, of course, but it illustrates it, I think, fairly well. Coming to a place where you've heard salvation takes place, where other people have been saved, or so you've heard anyway, they've been saved. That's not what you do. You come to Jesus. Now, I'm, I would argue, I'm not going to make a big point of it here, I would argue that Jesus is going to take you to the water. But nevertheless, he didn't for this man, illustrating that the power is in Jesus himself. That's where we put our faith. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, Jesus is described there as the uh, the author and finisher of our faith, the source and the finisher of our faith. And, and lately, I've taken to emphasizing the, uh, the second part of that, that he is the, uh, the finisher, that uh, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and has been risen up to the right hand of the glory of God. Uh, that is the case for us. Jesus will get us to the finish line. But he's also the author. He's also the beginner, the starter, as it were. And I think that point needs to be made also. If you want to be saved, you have to go to Jesus. He is the one who is going to get you on the road. And without overmaking the point here, he's going to tell you how to get on that road. We'll, we'll get to this in more specifics later on. But there is, there is personal accountability. None of that diminishes the power of Jesus. None of that diminishes 
the effect uh, the uh, effectiveness the uh, the uniquely e uh, efficient the uniquely effective power of salvation that's available in Jesus Christ that's where we put our faith that's the only place that we put our faith this man here is hoping that somehow some way despite all of his track record, despite his personal history, et cetera, that somehow he can find healing. He's been looking in the wrong place. He didn't know about Jesus. Although this man's faith is not discussed in this context, you would like to think anyway, as many other people did in Jesus' lifetime, that he could have gotten to know Jesus and believed in Jesus and turned to Jesus specifically for healing and that he would have been healed. That's not the way this story goes as it happens. But whether he deliberately or not deliberately finds Jesus as the source of salvation, either way, that's where the power is. Jesus is the one who is able to heal. And no matter where you are, no matter what you've done, no matter how crippled you may be in, the, in life's ways, Jesus can and Jesus will minister to you if you will go to him, if you will lean on him. And leaning on him means trusting in his words, listening to what he has to say. We'll have more to say about what specifically he has in the, in the next point. But in a general sense, we turn to Jesus, and then Jesus starts talking to us. And there are people who would seem to believe that the things Jesus says when we turn to him are of no relevance, no, no salvatory relevance anyway, no, nothing regarding whether we will or will not be saved. There may be a, a good pattern for life, something that will enhance you, something that will give you more joy or more peace or whatever. But as far as getting saved, Jesus' words don't seem to have anything to do with it. And I find that remarkable, and that's probably a euphemism. I find that terrifying, frankly. What's the point in coming to Jesus if we're not going to listen to what he has to say? People in Jesus' lifetime were coming from everywhere to listen to what Jesus had to say. Now, some people listened and some people didn't. The story uh, a page later in chapter 6 of John illustrates that pretty well, I think. They came in droves and Jesus fed them, of course, with a, just a handful of food, and they were pretty impressed with that. And then the, the, he and the disciples went away and the people tracked them down, not because the sermon was so great, but because the food was so great. And they were hoping, they were rather desperate, in fact, to find more food from him. And that's when Jesus gives us this great bread of life sermon. And the people just weren't especially interested in the bread of life. They kept turning the subject back to, to food, to physical food. Moses proved himself to be a prophet because he gave the man in the wilderness. Hey, what a great idea. Why don't you prove that you're the Messiah by giving us food in the wilderness like you did yesterday? Well, no, we're, we're not going to do that. Jesus deliberately turns away from that kind of mentality. And when he does, people of that mentality deliberately turn away from him. And this is a terribly important point. People who are not interested in the words of Jesus aren't really interested in Jesus. They don't put their confidence in his words. He is not truly their, their savior, their, the light of their, of their eyes. He's not really the one they're focusing on. They're just focused on material things, physical things, bread and fish. And Jesus, as you would expect, is somewhat discouraged by this. Uh, he's not willing that any should perish, of course. And so he turns to his disciples rather despairingly and says, are you going to leave me too? Verse 68 and 69. And Peter there says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have words of eternal life. And we've come to know that you are the son of God, paraphrasing a bit there in verse number 69. What a tremendous statement of faith there by Peter. And, and Peter, you know, bless his heart, gets it right sometimes. He gets it wrong sometimes too. But a person like Peter, who has, as he would be the first to admit, a severely limited understanding of what Jesus' mission is, about what Jesus' message is. He is not confused about who Jesus is at his core. Jesus is the Savior. He is the Son of God. And therefore, the things Jesus has to say matter. I may or may not understand them in the moment. I may or may not agree with them, quite frankly, in the moment. But these are the words of eternal life. If I'm not satisfied with Jesus, where would I want to go? If I want to live, if I want to be healed, it makes no sense for me to go somewhere else. And so I'm going to continue to go to Jesus. I'm going to continue to listen to what he has to say. And the things that he has to say 
including the things about baptism, by the way, not to beat that drum too much. The things that he has to say are relevant, and they may or may not coincide with your own personal think so, your own personal wisdom. In fact, I'll pretty much guarantee they won't coincide with your wisdom from time to time. That's when faith comes in. That's when it makes a difference that you actually trust in Jesus. You go to him asking for healing, and you have confidence that what he has to say is going to work. Whatever it is that he says, I'm going to believe everything that he says. I'm going to trust everything that he says. I'm going to go where he says go. I'm going to stay where he says stay. And if he happens to say, pick up your bed and walk, that's what I'm going to do. And I talked about personal initiative before. Let's, let's at least uh, deal with this in, in brief. The man is healed. And then he does what Jesus tells him to do. Does that mean that obedience is not necessary for salvation? No, it does not. It means that obedience is a demonstration of your faith. And when Jesus acts upon you, when Jesus comes into you, he brings healing to you, he is going to expect you to respond appropriately. And I really get very frustrated when I try to, to preach on this topic because it's like saying your Bible is printed on, on white paper with black letters. It's, it's so self-evident. It is replete throughout the scripture, Old and New Testament alike, that our interactions with God require us to submit our behavior to his will. Now, you can talk about work salvation or water salvation or whatever pejorative term you want to throw out there. Uh, out there. Jesus himself in his ministry, Jesus' representatives, Jesus' forerunners, the inspired writers and prophets, all of them unanimously require people of faith to do what he has told us to do before, during, and after our salvation. That's what Peter said to people who were clearly upset at their sinful situation on the day of Pentecost. Men and brethren, what shall we do? I'll tell you what to do. There's nothing you can do. There's absolutely nothing you can do. You are diminishing the grace that is available in Jesus. You're used to following the law for your salvation. I'm telling you that grace is free, that salvation is free, that you're saved simply by believing in the Lord Jesus. Peter did not preach that sermon. He had every opportunity to, as he did on many other instances, as many other gospel preachers and gospel writers had opportunity, none of them ever said that. They all said the same thing in one form or another. Come to Jesus and comply with his will. In this particular instance, Peter said essentially the same thing that he was told to say in the Great Commission. Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises to you and to your children and to those who are far off, even as many as the Lord your God should call. That's you and me. He's calling us now. And the message is the same for us as it was for them 2,000 years ago. Repent and be baptized. And he continues preaching, although we don't have much specifics about the, the rest of the sermon. We can assume it's more or less the same. All summed up with this phrase, be saved from this crooked generation, this untoward generation, this perverted generation. Take responsibility for yourself. Accept salvation. Now, different versions have this, this phrase here, be saved, as more active or more passive, etc. And uh, don't get too caught up in that. The idea is that you have an opportunity to receive the salvation that Jesus offers. Or not receive it. You can be saved or you can not be saved. That's your choice. And the people who choose salvation did what Peter told them to do. They were, in fact, baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of their sins, and God added them to the body of the saved and continued to do so, as verse 47 goes on to say. All those who followed this gospel message in succeeding days and, and weeks, and as it turns out, centuries, those who have done what Peter told the people at Pentecost to do, continue to be added to this body of the saved. Hebrews chapter uh, chapter 10 I mentioned uh, chapter uh, 12 a little earlier, chapter 11, also this roll call of faith. I'd like to read a few passages uh, from, uh, from chapter 10, a few verses, starting in verse number uh, 35. And this is quite typical, not just for the book of Hebrews, but for, for Old Testament passages in general and New Testament as well. 
He says, for um, so don't throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. And I'm not going to stop with every verse, but let me stop there. Don't throw away your confidence and you have a great reward. Don't quit on Jesus is what he's trying to say. Now, some people will try to say what that means is uh, be strong in your conviction because, you know, even though you're never going to lose your faith, you don't want to act like you're losing your faith. You want to you stay firm, et cetera. That's what he's saying, yes, but that's not all he's saying. And that's not all what all of the gospel writers have been saying. You can fall from this state of grace, as Paul mentions in, in Galatians 5, verse 4. Some of the Galatians have done exactly that. Other people have done that as well. He says, for you need endurance, you need endurance, so that after you have done God's will, you will, may receive what was promised. And I said I wasn't going to stop in every verse. Let me stop here, too. You need endurance so that you will receive what is promised. What's promised? Well, the gift of the Holy Spirit, the, the salvation, the home in heaven, and phrase it however you want. God has promised this to us, and God is faithful, but you and I may not be faithful. And as was the case in Old Testament times, it continues to be the case today, if we are not faithful, if we do not hold to this calling, this confession that Jesus has brought us to, that we have submitted ourselves to, if we are not going to endure, as evidently the writer here is worried that some of the Hebrew Christians weren't uh, going to endure, you, if you don't do God's will throughout your life, there is this danger that you'll fall from your steadfastness and fall from your reward. For you need endurance, he says, uh, so that after you've done God's will, you may receive what was promised for, and then quoting from uh, Habakkuk, uh, for in a very little while the coming one will come and not delay, but my righteous one will live by faith, and if he draws back, I have no pleasure in him. But we are not those who draw back and are destroyed, but those who have faith and are saved. Now, some people might want to just focus on verses 38 and 39 there and, and the word faith there and say, well, faith is what saves us. So if you have faith, that's, uh, that's all that matters. And you can define faith any way that you want. And full transparency here, the Bible describes faith in a variety of ways. Faith does not always mean exactly the same thing in every particular situation where the word comes up. It's pretty obvious what it means here, though. It means a lifetime of commitment. It means a thought pattern that manifests itself naturally and inevitably in a behavior pattern. And if you do not act according to your faith, you don't really have the faith, not the faith that he's talking about here, not the faith that's going to lead to life, not the faith that characterizes the people described in Hebrews chapter 11. Faith fails from time to time. Certainly, our behavior will not match up the standards from time to time, yes. But if you adopt a lifestyle of faith, and that faith is demonstrated, and how else would you demonstrate it? By a pattern of behavior, a pattern of obedience, an emphasis on compliance with God's will. This shows yourself to be the, uh, the person of God, the man or woman of God, and shows yourself to be the person of faith, the one who is going to be given this reward at the end. Now, God's going to be the judge of exactly what constitutes faithful. And I'm certainly not suggesting that you need a certain number of gold stars next to your attendance record or help a certain number of little old ladies cross the street or, or whatever. That's not the point at all. Usually that's the way that works salvation is described, and I'm against that. I'm absolutely against that. But let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. The Bible maintains consistently and repetitively, uh, repetitively that God is going to require you, again, before, during, and after, to comply with his will, to do his will. Rebelling against the will of God after salvation is no more acceptable than rebelling against his will prior to salvation. It's exactly the same because the attitude is exactly the same. What we need to do in these moments as we see this layman coming for healing and finding healing in Jesus, we need to be inspired to find that healing ourselves to look to him, to allow him to speak our sins away and allow him to usher us into this, this marvelous envelope of grace. But we also need to understand he's going to do it on his terms, in his way. And no single passage, John 3, 16, or any other passage of scripture is going to tell you everything that God expects out of you in life. That'd be kind of handy, but that would also facilitate a very lazy attitude toward Bible study, and clearly that's not what God wants. God wants us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, 
the text there says in Philippians 2, verse 12, and read whatever version of your Bible you want. I suspect you're going to find the same thing there. You take the bull by the horns. You take responsibility for your, your own salvation. That's not to say that we take the wheel out of Jesus' hands, that we're assuming accountability entirely. We're always going to be saved by grace if we are ever going to be saved at all. But that does not mean that we can just sit here and allow Jesus to save us, independent of our own choices. He causes us to have the power, the opportunity to rise up and walk in the light as he himself is in the light, but we have to choose to do that very thing. Now, we could talk for hours and hours about how exactly that works. We're going to leave that for now and encourage you to continue to read your Bible, to continue to study the idea of salvation as Jesus offers it on the terms, and there are terms that Jesus offers it. I will briefly mention, I'm not contractually obligated to, but I usually do, passages like Mark 16, 16, where Jesus says there specifically, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. We could turn to many, many other passages also. But that's just one example of what Jesus requires of us. And by the way, I have yet to find anybody who actually believed that you don't have to do anything to be saved. There may be some absolute universalists out there who think that the blood of Jesus means that everybody's going to be saved and it doesn't matter whether you're an axe murderer, a bank robber, a child molester or whatever, it, it doesn't make any difference. You're going to be saved because that's how powerful the blood of Jesus is. Maybe there are some people out there who say that. But most of the people that I have heard who extol the, the virtues, the value, the power of the grace that's available in the blood of Jesus Christ and who say that works are irrelevant, that works are not part of the process, do in fact believe that you have to come to faith. That's a choice. They do believe that you have to confess Jesus as Lord. That's a choice. That's a behavior. And when their lifestyle does not measure up to the lifestyle that Jesus has meshed out, they, they wind up rebelling or whatever. The assumption oftentimes is, well, they weren't really saved. Clearly a Christian wouldn't behave that way. That is a way of showing behavior as a marker for salvation. Everybody believes that. Your markers may be a little different than mine, but let's not fool ourselves into thinking that we actually believe we don't have to do anything to be saved. Let's acknowledge, yes, there is something to do, and Here's my, my suggestion. Let's let Jesus tell us what we need to do instead of figuring out on our own, apart from what God's word says, what those things actually are. Not just baptism, but everything that we do. And give him the glory, obviously, through it all. Not proclaiming our own works, our own superiority, our own value, but rather acknowledging that it is God who is at work in us to will and work for his good pleasure, as the text continues to say there in Philippians 2, verse 13. That's what Jesus is working in us and what he will continue to work in us if we are people of faith. So find faith in Jesus and turn to him for salvation if you have not done so already. Thank you very much for following along. Continue to read and study your Bible. Pray and draw closer to heaven every day of your life. Thank you very much. God bless.